So next talk is called Smaller Decoding Exponents, Ball Collision Decoding by Dan Bernstein, Tanya Lange, and uh, Christiane Peters. Uh, Dan will be the speaker. Testing, one, two, three, leakage, leakage, leakage. Okay. All right, it's getting very near the end, so I think it's time to relax a bit, look at the big picture. There's a lot of users who have performance problems. Well, other problems too, but users in particular have cryptographic performance problems, and so they ask questions like, what's the fastest public key encryption system? I'm trying to run a web server on my cell phone, and it has to be secure, and what should I do? And well, cryptographers have answers to these questions, like, let's uh, give them RSA 1024, that's pretty fast. And actually, we have even faster public key encryption systems, like RSA 512 or RSA 256. We can make really, really fast public key encryption systems. But OK, this is not a meaningful question. But at some point, the user says, wait, wait, I actually want some security here. And the users are going to vary in their idea of what security level they want. I'll just leave this as a variable, 2 to the b. The user wants security 2 to the b, and then asks whatever the b they have in mind, what is the fastest public key encryption system? Well, you still have to do some definitions here to, to make this question meaningful. For instance, uh, OK, security level 2 to the b, does that mean that, that every attack costs at least 2 to the b? No, of course, you can have attacks that cost a lot less and, and don't work very often. And OK, should you just say attacks with probability 1? Well, no, that's, that's allowing. Uh, that's saying your, your attack has to work all the time, but you, you also want to say, I, I'm looking at attacks which occasionally work, say, 1% of the time. And, uh, then you start making the definition more complicated, and eventually you end up with something which is kind of meaningful for the users. But then you have to do some real work. Then you have to say, OK, there's all these encryption systems out there. And now, which ones are the fastest ones with security level at least 2 to the b? Maybe you first look at the security, spend years and years figuring out what the most secure systems are. And for each system, you then know, OK, the best attacks we have are taking more than 2 to the b time. And now, out of all those systems, what are the fastest ones? And these are some algorithm design questions which occupy thousands and thousands of papers. These cryptanalytic and cryptographic algorithms are something that are, these are one of the core activities in cryptography. For instance, for RSA, there's all these papers on integer factorization and other attacks against RSA. But if you use RSA sensibly, then the best attacks we know are integer factorization. And there's some complicated formula for uh, how fast the number field sieve is, which is the, the fastest integer factorization algorithm. It's this 2 to the cube root of log n. Well, maybe not exactly cube root. It's like some power of log n that converges to, to 1 third as n goes to infinity. If you want to know for, for a particular value of n uh, how hard this is, you have to do a much more detailed analysis. But this is the, the asymptotic. And then once you know this 2 to the cube root of log n, if you want that to be at least 2 to the b, OK, that means cube root of log n has to be uh, at least b. So log n should be like b cubed. Then you figure out what exactly it should be, looking in more detail if you want to know for a particular b. Then once you know that log n, your number of bits in your RSA modulus n, is b cubed, then you look at how fast the encryption algorithms are, and lots and lots of papers on that. And asymptotically, it's something essentially linear in log n, which means at the end of the day that RSA encryption costs b cubed bit operations. OK, that's not the best that we have. For instance, elliptic curve cryptography is certainly faster. And again, you have to use sensible elliptic curve cryptography, throw away all the, the low security variants that people have uh, explored and say, OK, we want a conservative system. And the best elliptic curves that we have appear to be breakable in, at best time, something like square root of q, where q is the field size, or to use this exponential notation, 2 to the half log q. If you want half log q to be at least b, where b is your security level, then, OK, that means that, that log q should be something like 2b, something linear in b. On the other hand, the, the encryption in elliptic curve cryptography is quite a bit slower compared to the, the size q, the number of bits log q. Uh, it's, it's quadratic in log q to do scalar multiplication, do elliptic curve encryption. So at the end of the day, you end up with, well, elliptic curve cryptography is the square of this log q, where log q is linear in b. So elliptic curve cryptography costs b squared which is a lot better than b cubed. This asymptotic analysis 
tells you that, well, once B is sufficiently large, elliptic curve cryptography is much, much faster than, than RSA. And actually, it's got other advantages, like the decryption is also very, very fast. But maybe there's something better. Another conservative system that's been studied a lot, been around for a while, is the McLeese code-based system. And again, there's all sorts of ways that you can uh, vary this system, which uh, can get you in trouble, just like for elliptic curve cryptography and RSA, but if you take conservative choices that have been around for a long time and studied a lot, then the best attacks that we have against this system take time, well, in terms of some code length n, they take time 2 to the some constant n over log n. Now, if you want that to be at least 2 to the b, then that tells you n should be some constant times b log b. And then you look at how fast the encryption operation is, which is some very easy matrix multiplication, takes time n squared, along with some padding, which also fits in time n squared. And that means that McLeese, well, at first glance, it's very, very similar to elliptic curve cryptography in speed. It's, it's taking time n squared, where n is, is like b log b, and okay, haven't figured out what the little o of 1 is. At this level of detail, you actually can't tell which of these is asymptotically faster. But hey, let's look in a little more detail, and here's what you see. Elliptic curve cryptography, if you're doing a scalar multiplication over FQ, you need something like log Q uh, elliptic curve operations, which turn into some constant times log Q field operations, each of which costs something like log Q, log, log Q, log, log, log Q, I sound like an analytic number theorist here, uh, bit operations. So the total time is something like log Q was, was B times some constant. So total times B squared log B log log B. McLeese, if you use standard speed up, then you end up in terms of this code length n, whatever that is, you end up taking n over log n additions of n bit vectors n over log n times n exclusive ors, where n was, okay, b log b, I said before, so the total is there n squared over log n, where n is b log b, that's b squared log b, which is asymptotically better than b squared log b log log b. Hey, McLeese is actually faster for sufficiently large b than elliptic curve cryptography. And actually, it's got other advantages, like people often point to the post-quantum feature of it that, it, as far as we know, is immune to quantum computers. I guess there will be some comments on this in the next talk. It's also got very, very fast uh, decryption. All right. I've been telling you some asymptotics, which are reflecting the current knowledge of cryptanalytic and cryptographic algorithms. But of course, these algorithms change. You could have, for instance, faster multiplication algorithms. And actually, I've already told you something a little behind the state of the art for elliptic curve cryptography, you can speed up the multiplications in elliptic curve cryptography, you get something which is asymptotically uh, closing a lot of that gap between ECC and McLeese. And maybe you can close the entire gap with more work on multiplication or on higher level aspects of ECC. You could also try to speed up attacks. And that's what the rest of this talk is about, is faster attacks against McLeese, which mean that you need bigger McLeese key sizes, and that slows McLeese down, which also maybe closes the gap between ECC and McLeese. And a different type of speed up, which I'll mention here, is you can look at variations which are harder to break, have more defenses. And we think that a particular variation of McLeese, subfield AG code based cryptography, is going to be better than McLeese, have a better trade off between speed and security. Uh, it hopefully will even get rid of the log factor. So instead of b squared log b, it'll be just b squared encryption time. Okay, rest of the talk, I'll focus on part two, attacking McLeese. The attacks that we have, the best attacks since McLeese introduced the system have always been generic decoding attacks. There are lots and lots of papers looking at this, and um, I'm not going to describe how these attacks break McLeese, or the Niederreiter version, but I will describe what these attacks are supposed to be doing. A generic decoding algorithm for people who know coding theory, this is you have a, some random code, pretty much any code, and you have somebody's given you a code word with some errors, and then find the uh, errors. It's a closest vector problem for codes instead of lattices. So here's what the problem looks like for, for, uh, for everybody. If you look at this problem, you should think of this as a, a some sort of subset sum problem. You're given 900, in this case, vectors. Each of them is 500 bits long, R1 through R900. And the problem is to come up with a subset of those of a particular size, 
the size being 50. So find 50 of these rows that have their sum mod 2, their exclusive or equal to s, where s is another input. All right, so that's the decoding problem. That's what all these papers have been looking at, is for, for random choices of r, for essentially any choices of r, uh, and random choices of s that are sums of 50 of these rows, how can you figure out what those rows are? Maybe s is equal to r2 plus r7 plus r34, et cetera. How do you uh, figure out that 2, 7, 34, and so on? You can try to simplify this problem a bit and do some self-reducibility of this problem. For instance, you can take the rows and, and permute them, like let me try switching, is this gonna work? Yeah, so I'll flip R1 and R2, and if you look at the bottom, you see that S is changing as well between R1 and R2. You can permute the rows, doesn't change the, the problem. You can also permute the columns. So let me try flipping uh, two of the columns. Hey, that works too. PDF animation, amazing thing. Uh, and you can actually do more. You can add one column to another. It also doesn't change the problem, which means actually you can do row reduction. You can do Gaussian elimination. You can make a, an identity matrix, assuming you have a, a full rank matrix of R's, which 900 random vectors are essentially always going to have uh, dimension 500. And assuming you have that, then you can turn the first 500 of those into an identity matrix. And now, is S a sum of uh, 50 of these vectors? Assume it is. How do you figure out those 50 vectors? Well, maybe, maybe you get really lucky. This is the starting point of the algorithms, saying maybe you have S being a sum of some of those identity matrix rows up at the top. You have a really easy subset sum problem if you're adding up, say, R1 and R2, or any of the first 50 there, any of the first 500, if you have 50 out of those, then you'll just see exactly those red bits showing up in S. And maybe that's what happened in this example. Okay, it's not a huge chance of it happening. This means that your 50 rows have to all be in the first half, roughly, something like a 2 to the minus 50 chance of this happening. Do a more precise binomial coefficient analysis of this. Uh, there's some chance that it happens. And then if it happens, it's really, really easy to see that. If that happens, then you just look at, at S and see where the, the red bits are. And then, I mean, see where the ones are. If S has weight 50, has the number of one bits being exactly 50, then you're done once you've reduced this matrix to systematic form. If that doesn't happen, if you don't get lucky, then, well, you just repermute the rows and repermute the columns, do row reduction again, and try again with another selection of, of rows. Okay, so this is information set decoding in its most basic form. And all the, the subsequent literature is, is refining this idea in all sorts of cute ways. And let me show you a few of those ways and then try to say what it is that we did in this paper. Lee Brickell in 88 said, okay, you could have all your 50 rows being among the first 500, but there's a significantly, well, much better chance of having a split of, say, 48 on top and two on the bottom. I actually have a, a picture of this. Um, Okay, so 48 out of the first 500 rows are selected, and then two out of the remaining 400 are selected, some ri and rj, which together add up to s. And you can recognize this by searching through the possibilities for i and j. There's some quadratic number of possibilities for the ri and rj, and then XOR them into s and see if you have weight 48. If you have exactly 48 bits set for the, for the result, then okay, that tells you the 48 rows out of the first 500. And actually, this is not just an algorithm which is more likely to succeed on each iteration, but actually each iteration is almost as fast as the previous algorithm because you've spent about as much time on linear algebra as you do searching through the possibilities for the i and j. And then Leon and independently Kruk came along and said, well, if you're looking for some S plus RI plus RJ where there's only 48 bits set out of uh, 500, then there's a pretty good chance that the first 10 bits are all going to be zeros. It's not guaranteed, but you won't lose much uh, success probability if you insist on that. And you gain quite a lot of speed in each iteration. It's certainly worthwhile to do this. So you insist that the first 10 bits of S plus RI plus RJ be zero, and then if they are all zero, which is like a 2 to the minus 10 chance, then you check weight 48 for the rest of it. And this speeds up the iteration so much to be worthwhile compared to um, the loss of success probability. And then Stern, the gold standard in these algorithms for many years, which we call collision decoding, said, hey, exactly this algorithm, there's a square root attack. Look at what happened here. There's, there's this S 
plus ri plus rj, which we want to have the first 10 bits of that being all zero. That's the same as saying that s plus ri, first 10 bits, are equal to rj, first 10 bits. And now we've separated the i and j. So Stern says, look through the, the ri's, look through the, the possibilities for i, take the first 10 bits of s plus ri, put them in a hash table or something, and then uh, look through the first 10 bits of all the rj's, and then match. Do a sort and match, or hashing, whatever. And then you get a very fast uh, iteration, much faster than you do for Leon and Kruk. And then once you've found collisions between the s plus ri and the rj, then you check the weight of those uh, collisions, s plus ri plus rj. All right, here's another picture. Here's what it looks like for uh, Stern. You've got, uh, you're insisting now on having no, uh, out of the, the weight 48 vector, the, the 48 rows selected out of the first 500, the first 10 of those don't appear. So the first 10 rows don't appear in the, in the sum. And then the, out of the next 490, 48 of those appear. And then out of the remaining 400, two of those appear. And you search through the two by separately looking at the searching through the i's, adding to s, searching through the j's, do this square root attack, and then you find, uh, for each of the results, do you have weight 48. Now, looking at this, because Stern has sped up the, the search through the i-j pairs by only looking through the i's and j's separately, he has time to actually look for more. So he says, okay, let's, let's have a bunch of i's and a bunch of j's. For instance, two i's and two j's. But actually, the optimum number goes to infinity as everything gets bigger and bigger. So Stern actually has more and more uh, rows on the bottom that are being added together. And then, uh, of course, all the other parameters you have to optimize as well. All right, so what does our algorithm do for this example? Well, instead of saying, just look for collisions between s plus ri, or after you've put in more rows, s plus ri1 plus ri2, instead of looking for collisions between the first 10 bits of that and the first 10 bits of, say, rj1 plus rj2, take each of those 10-bit strings and add some errors in every possible position. So make a little hamming ball around those 10-bit vectors. Take 10 bits and then take, for instance, out of the first five bits, put, change each of those uh, five bits. So now you have five different vectors related to this 10-bit vector, and then do the same with the other vector and the other uh, five bits. And then look for collisions between all those 25 possibilities. So there's more searching going on here. There's, uh, there's some extra uh, collision detection, more uh, bigger lists of stuff to, to look through. But we get an increase in the success chance. We're allowing now two errors out of the first 10 rows, and then 44 out of the remaining uh, 490 in the top half, and then four on the bottom, or whatever the right parameters are. You have to, of course, optimize all the numbers. Um, but this is the, the basic change that we make to, to Stern's algorithm, which is looking for collisions between these uh, balls instead of between the uh, individual points. So last slide is that the main theorem which you can find a proof of online, the main theorem that we have is that the, the exponent of this algorithm is better than the exponent of Stern's algorithm for any particular constant uh, ratio between all the sizes involved, the number of rows involved, and the total size of the matrix, and so on. We have a smaller exponent, alpha prime, compared to the exponent of Stern's algorithm. And we also, if you look at the paper, we have reasons to think that this is optimal. We've optimized everything that we can. If you can find another idea, uh, great, you can do maybe better. We also say in the paper, if you want to be just totally sure about all these algorithms being fine, we have some lower bounds that you would have an incredibly difficult time getting anywhere near those. And to make sure that our analysis is completely correct, we did it in so much detail that we could check it against a computer implementation. To finish, let me just say, I think this is the end, even if it's not the end for, uh, for attacks against McLeese. It's so close to the end that I'm very, very confident in McLeese. And uh, I'm looking forward to somebody building a quantum computer so we can actually start deploying this in practice. Thanks for your attention. So we have time for one brief question. So what, what are the lower bounds based on? So the lower bound is saying, We've got a, a very broad idea of what these kinds of algorithms do. And then we say, uh, if you have anything that looks like that, and anything with any sort of iterations like that, and be extremely uh, 
optimistic in how far algorithms like this could conceivably go, then uh, here's how fast that best possible algorithm could be. Of course, if you go outside that, that structure for the algorithms, then you could conceivably do better. The lower bounds are, are not too painful for implementers that they're separated by something like 10 or 20 percent in uh, final key size from, uh, from what you would get by looking at the best attacks. And of course, if you, if you want to uh, really cut things close and have a system that's just barely um, beyond the best attacks that we have, then you're going to have a system which is, well, smaller key size, a little faster. Uh, but these lower bounds are saying, as usual for this, kind of, uh, for this kind of analysis, they're saying we have a general idea of what these algorithms should do, and then if you have anything in this class, it's not going to do better than the following quantitative uh, performance. So let's thank the speaker again.